we've been talking about questions, these deep existential questions. And we want to put them to the test, and our society values what science has to say. So we'd like scientific answers to some of these questions. Well, the questions that we put to science run the gamut. They're simple questions, and they range all the way to these difficult questions. And I think it's interesting to look at the contrast, because the difficult questions need to be looked at in a different way. Uh, simple questions would be things that we determine, like, you know, does a particular drug work? Uh, what type of material is best used in, in this application? I work in the electronics industry, and we do scientific tests on things all the time. We might want to know how reliable a component is, or how long it's going to last under hot conditions or cold conditions. And we can run scientific tests to try and determine this. And we can talk to a statistician and find out exactly how many tests we have to run. And if we run 500 or 1,000 tests, how confident we can be in the answers we get. This is simple. Uh, it's well-developed science, but it's still science. Now, these difficult questions, um, they don't lend themselves to that kind of research. Um, in fact, it's interesting when you look back at the difficult questions that have been I existed in science over the whole history of our scientific investigations, it turns out that the, uh, most of the questions just kind of disappear or evaporate as we gain a deeper understanding of our reality. Um, the science is just littered with this type of stuff. If you look at Wikipedia, you'll find um, it, it, hundreds of failed theories in science. Um, it's interesting to look at what happens to these questions. Um, very famously, we had a, a, a model of the Earth at one time where it was flat. Now, this was intuitive, and um, it seems like, uh, I, I, su I suppose, ancient people would see things fall downwards all the time. So why would the Earth be anything other than flat? It always seems like everything goes that one direction, down. Um, it seemed like the, the model was like a disk of the Earth, and that might be because they, as they look around the horizon, it looks like it's sort of round. Well, it raised questions uh, when you have this model. Uh, and it's interesting to look at these questions. Ancient mariners were concerned about the edge of the Earth. What happens there? Um, what's holding the water in? Uh, is it just spilling over the edge? What would happen if I sail too close to the edge of the Earth? Would the water, um, uh, would I go over the edge with the water? Um, this disk that the Earth is made of, what's it sitting on? There were some models of the Earth where the Earth was sitting on top of turtles. There were giant turtles holding up these disks. It explains some things, like uh, earthquakes. When a turtle would shift its weight, the disk would move, and uh, that's an explanation for an earthquake. Well, and obviously, we live on a round Earth. I suppose ancient people first started noticing the uh, curvature of the Earth when they looked at the shadow of, on the moon during a lunar eclipse. They would see this curve, and eventually other clues came to surface and we decided and discovered that we lived on a round or spherical Earth. Well, what's interesting is what happened to these questions? How, how, did, these, uh, how, how did these questions evaporate? Well, it, they just no longer had any relevance. The model changed. The, sometimes science calls this the paradigm. Uh, we'll talk more about that. But the, the whole model shifted to something completely different and these questions had no longer had any relevance. Uh, there was no edge of the Earth, so the water pouring over the edge was no longer a concern. There's another uh, good example that I found, um, uh, the caloric theory of heat. Um, at one time, we thought heat was actually a substance. It was made of, uh, of some kind of, we didn't know what exactly. That was the question. What was this substance that was caloric? But we knew that if we burned logs under a pot of water and brought it to a boil, we, could, uh, we imagined that there was a substance called caloric coming out of the logs and going into the pot and causing the water to boil. But then there was other phenomena. Like, for instance, the, um, uh, you, if you rub some things together, friction caused heat. And it seemed like both objects that were being rubbed together would heat. Uh, it wasn't like the heat was confined to, or flowing from one object to another. And it seemed like there was an unlimited supply. Now, that was a legitimate scientific question. Where is this caloric coming from if I can have an unlimited supply by rubbing things together? Well, 
eventually, after uh, drilling some cannons, Lord Rutherford discovered the kinetic theory of heat that we still have today, where molecules are in motion. And the question about the caloric just evaporated. We discovered that there really needed to be no substance called caloric, that everything was, um, it, that the motion of the molecules accounted for everything that happens. So the question evaporates. Well, here's where I'm going with this. In the beginning, we asked a bunch of existential questions, like uh, where did the matter in the universe come from? Uh, where did the order, the initial ordering of the universe come from? Uh, what, uh, why am I having this conscious experience as I travel through time and space? Well, I can't prove it, but my gut feeling is that these are going to be the types of questions that evaporate eventually, and we're going to gain a deeper understanding. Um, I don't know that it's going to be coming very fast, but I want to mention something. There's a fellow who's got an excellent website, at least he initially started it. His name's Eli Yudkowsky, and his website is called Less Wrong, and he's, he did a lot of the original posts, and they're excellent. In one of them, he talks about wrong questions and how they can eventually change, and he makes a suggestion for writing a wrong question or correcting a wrong question. And it, I think we can apply this, that here. Um, he takes the question and turns it inside out makes it more about our experience or about what we know for sure. For instance, take the question, why are we having this conscious experience? If you turn that question into a question like, why do I feel like I'm having this conscious experience? It might be a more correct question. Uh, we certainly know we're having this experience of a conscious uh, traveling through time and space. So possibly, that's a more correct question, and it'll be more fruitful in leading to an answer. It also relates more to something that's going to come up as this video series goes on. Um, it's probably more correct to talk about our perception of what's happening than to talk about it as a reality. The whole idea of scientific reality, whether science is actually discovering realities, is getting philosophically tricky, and we're going to have to talk about that. But we do know that as we look at things that are very, very small or very, very big, down at the quantum level or at the cosmological level, we discover that the rules are completely different. Physics is different. And some people have suggested that this means that what we see here, things that are our size that we handle every day, watermelons, chairs, tables, these things are illusory. There, there's an illusion there. Well. I, do, I think there's some correctness to this concept, but I don't mean to suggest it in a, any weird spiritual way right now. All I'm saying is that you have to take into account that we're having this experience, but it may not be, the, um, it may not be exactly of what we think we're experiencing. And it's important because this is when things get interesting. You can study all the quantum physics you want. And it's going to come down to rules and the mathematics of the behavior of objects in the quantum world, the quarks, the electrons. And the theories are very, very um, tested. And they turn out to be right in every case where we've tested them. We trust these theories quite a bit. Maybe more so than any th theories that we've got, we trust these theories. But it becomes really interesting when we start asking the question, okay, how do these rules create the reality that we are having? Where's the interface between these rules and my brain? This is what's, uh, where it gets fascinating, and this is where I think the questions are going to be fruitful. Um, we're going to talk about more of that. So I hope you're enjoying this, and I hope you're finding it interesting. Um, until next time, thank you.